Well, thank you for the invitation. It's, a, it's really a great pleasure um, to speak to you uh, today at the India Science Festival. I think you can tell from my, from my it's, it's always a delight to hear my name pronounced properly when, when being introduced. It doesn't happen very often at meetings. In fact, I can't do it myself because although my family is, uh, well, I'm half Indian, my majority of my family come from Allahabad and UP, but I was born and brought up in the UK. So unfortunately, I don't speak um, Hindi or any other Indian language, but it's a, definitely a big part of my, my heritage. And I always enjoy talking uh, to Indian audiences about my work, about consciousness, because I think there's a very interesting dialogue <clears throat> to be had here. I also just need to apologize briefly. I'm still recovering from COVID. As you know, the UK has done a horrendous job of managing COVID over the last year. And uh, so I'm a little bit short of voice. So um, I will do my best, but I'm not exactly firing on all cylinders, but I will try. Okay. So with that, this is going to be a general like half hour little talk about consciousness. Um, and it, it gives a, an overview of some, but not by no, no means all of the themes that I discuss in this new book. Uh, and the book is really a, uh, it's the fruits of about the last 20, 25 years that I've spent working on uh, the neuroscience, the biology of consciousness, both in the UK and in, and in the US. So I think we need to start, as always, with a definition. When we talk about consciousness, what exactly are we talking about? Well, I think the definition is, is very simple. And I want to, we're not going to come up with a consensus definition that everybody automatically agrees with. But what I want to do is, is give uh, an intuitive definition just so we don't talk past each other, that we can start off at least on the same page. And for me, consciousness is any kind of subjective experience whatsoever. It's not the same as intelligence. It's not the same as language. It's not the same as the experience of being a self. It's, it's any experience, whether it's pain, pleasure, a thought, an emotion, a feeling of intention. These are all aspects of consciousness. Now, a little bit more formally, I always uh, prefer to start with the definition of the philosopher Thomas Nagel. Um, we were just hearing about the philosophy of science in India, Thomas Nagel, the great philosopher um, and historian of science too. And his definition of consciousness, which goes back to the 1970s, is that an organism has conscious mental states if and only if there is something it is like to be that organism. If it feels like something to be that organism, it feels like something to be me. It feels like something to be each one of you. It probably feels like something to be a bat. Um, as Thomas Nagel's famous paper said, uh, for those of you who know it, what is it like to be a bat? We humans don't know. We can't experience the inner universe of a bat. But for the bat, there, it feels like something to be that bat. And the same for probably many other animals too. But there is probably nothing it feels like to be a stapler or a table or even an iPhone. It's, it's a mechanism, a complex mechanism, but it doesn't feel like anything to be that complex mechanism. That's the broadest definition of consciousness. Now, this raises the question of how do we begin to understand consciousness within our wider picture of the natural world. And our wider picture of the natural world, at least in, in Western science and philosophy, tends to be materialistic, tends to be physicalist, tends to be in terms of some description of matter and the interactions uh, among whatever matter ultimately is. And so how do these interactions give rise to or, or in some way become identical with consciousness is one of these outstanding problems in science and philosophy that's been with us in different guises and in different cultures for thousands of years. And it's probably most um, best crystallized, or certainly the best known crystallization of this problem is by David Chance, the, the philosopher who took this problem, which has been you know, articulated by Rene Descartes, by all sorts of people, and put it in terms of the hard problem of consciousness. Here is what he says. He says, this is in the 90s, it is widely agreed that experience arises from a physical basis, but we have no good explanation of why and how it so arises. Why should physical 
processing give rise to a rich inner life at all? It seems objectively unreasonable that it should, and yet it does. So Chalmers' um, contrast this hard problem with the easy problems of, con of, of neuroscience, of consciousness. And the easy problems, basically, are all the problems that neuroscience or any science can tackle that need not make any reference to consciousness at all how the brain as a mechanism implements all the functions and underlies all the behaviors that it does, how it transforms sensory input into muscle contractions and outputs and things like that. These, of course, are not easy problems. They're very, very challenging problems. But the intuition is there's no conceptual mystery that functions and behaviors can, in principle, be explained by complex mechanisms. That's the normal business of science and engineering. And Chalmers' intuition is that even after you've solved all these easy problems at the end of neuroscience, this hard problem will remain pristine, untouched, as mysterious as it seems today. And this gives rise, this sort of motivates this idea of dualism, that the physical universe and the universe of consciousness are two different modes and the challenges then how they interact. That's one way to think about this. Of course, thinking of this mystery in this very black and white sense gives rise to an, a, a bunch of other potential responses. One that's becoming increasingly popular, at least in, in like, well, uh, if not academically, it's certainly getting a lot more um, uh, air these days, is this idea of panpsychism. That consciousness is somehow fundamental and ubiquitous, it's somehow in everything and everywhere. Now, this obviates the hard problem because if consciousness is built into the fabric of the universe from the ground up, well, you don't need to explain how it comes to be. Uh, so it's consistent. The issue, or at least my issue with panpsychism is not so much that it seems crazy, it's just that it doesn't explain anything, it can't be tested, and it doesn't generate any testable hypotheses. So it's a bit of a, a lame answer to, I think, this, this mystery that, that we all face about trying to understand what consciousness is like and, and why it's there. Now, another extreme, and this is again a, a position articulated by a number of philosophers like um, Keith Frankish, Daniel Dennett, Mike Graziano, is that we're just mistaken if we think there's anything particularly special or significant about the consciousness uh, as a scientific and philosophical problem. Illusionism is the position that consciousness doesn't really exist, at least not how we normally think of it. Now, I have a bit more sympathy for this position, but I think of it as a bit like a powerful medicine. If you take just the right amount, it's very helpful because it can undercut some of our naive intuitions about what we're trying to explain when we're trying to explain consciousness. An example of such naive intuition would be that the conscious self is the recipient of conscious experiences rather than part of consciousness. And we'll come to that later. But if you take too much of this illusionist medicine, I think you get into trouble because then you start denying the central phenomenon that we're trying to explain, that conscious experiences are real that they exist, that there is something it is like to be a conscious creature. So that's illusionism. So I, don't, I find it just useful to know, just to stake out the territory. But the approach I take is neither of these really, um, although illusionists sometimes claim that it is, it's called the real problem of consciousness, not the hard problem and not the easy problem. And the real problem of consciousness, this is the approach I just explore in the book, is to ask a slightly different question. It's to ask, how can mechanisms and processes in the brain and the body explain, predict, and control properties of consciousness, both functional, like what can we do in virtue of being conscious, and critically, phenomenological? Why is a visual experience the way it is and different from, let's say, an olfactory experience or an emotional experience? What about what happens in brains and bodies that explains the qualitative phenomenal character of different kinds of experiences. That's the real problem. Now, this is neither the hard problem nor the easy problem. It's not the hard problem because we're not trying to say, 
how and why consciousness is part of the universe in the first place. It's also not the easy problem because we're not sweeping the mystery of consciousness away under the carpet and pretending it doesn't exist. It's certainly not a new approach. It inherits from a number of traditions. The, the tradition that I think is closest is called, often called neurophenomenology, pioneered by people like Frances, Francesco Varela, <coughs> Evan Thompson, and, and so on, which is, again, this idea of understanding phenomenological properties in terms of neural mechanisms. Now, if we do this, and I'm going to give you some examples of what this looks like in practice, then I do think we stand a chance of coming up with a satisfactory science of consciousness. But instead of solving the hard problem of David Chalmers head on, I think we'll achieve this through dissolving it. And there's a precedent to thinking this way. Um, and the main precedent for me is how we came to a modern understanding of life. You know, it was not that long ago, again in Western scientific circles, that life was considered to be beyond the remit of physics and chemistry, that there had to be some spark of life, some special source, some elan vital that explained the difference between the living and the non-living. This was the philosophy of vitalism, which was very prominent in the late 19th through a surprising chunk of the 20th century. But of course, as biologists got on with the job, of explaining the properties of living systems like metabolism and reproduction and so on in terms of physics and chemistry, then this hard problem of life seemed little by little less mysterious and eventually it dissolved. It wasn't solved. It wasn't like people found the spark of life or proved that life didn't exist. It's just that the need to appeal to that sense of one, there being one big scary mystery faded away as we understood more about how to explain properties in terms of mechanisms. And I think the same strategy is helping us and will help us understand consciousness. Now, I don't want to overdo this parallel. It's obviously consciousness and life are not the same thing. One of the methodologically, the big difference between trying to understand a living system and trying to understand consciousness is that you can put a living system on a, like a table or on a lab bench and all look at it and all agree about what the data are. You can agree about what's going on. Um, but a conscious experience is intrinsically private and subjective. I can describe my conscious experiences, but that's not the same as you having direct access to what I'm experiencing. You cannot put a conscious experience on the table and look at it in the same way you can put a frog on a table and look at it. But this doesn't mean that the science of consciousness is impossible. No, it just means the relevant data are harder to collect. And that's a challenge, but it shouldn't undermine this approach. Okay, so if we take this approach, next comes the question of, well, if we're not going to treat consciousness as one big scary mystery, how do we treat it? How do we divvy it up into different properties? And there are many ways to do this. My preferred way is in terms of three basic features of consciousness, conscious level, how conscious you are. This is broadly the difference between being in a dreamless sleep or under anesthesia and being awake and aware, as we all are now. Conscious content, when you are conscious, you're conscious of something. The people, places, and objects that populate are conscious seen at any one time. And then there's conscious self, the experience of being an individual in the world, um, of being you. Now, I'm not going to talk about level today, but I'm going to talk about content and a little bit about self in the 15 minutes I have left. So there's one animating idea that I think is very useful to understand why our experiences of the world and of the self are the way they are. And this is the idea that the brain is a prediction machine and that what we see hear and feel, and nothing other than the brain's best guesses about the causes of its sensory inputs. Now, this is, again, not a new idea. Its roots can be traced back in philosophy as far as you want to go, at least as far as Plato, for instance, and, uh, and this allegory of the cave of Plato, where um, the shadows cast by firelight on the walls of this cave are treated as the real world by the prisoners within, because that's all they know. 
and updating that allegory to the 21st century, the 20th century, we come up with this idea of perception as inference. And understand this, just change perspective for a bit and imagine that you are your brain. And there you are, you're stuck inside a bony skull trying to figure out what's out there in the world. Now, there's no light in the skull, there's no sound. All you've got to go on as a brain are streams of electrical signals which are only indirectly related to what's out there in the world, whatever that might be. So perception, this process of figuring out what's there, has to be a process of informed guesswork in which ambiguous sensory signals are combined with the brain's prior expectations or beliefs about the way the world is to form the brain's best guess of the causes of these signals. The brain doesn't see light or hear sound. What we perceive is the brain's best guess of what's out there. Let me give you a couple of examples to show at least how this works a little bit in practice. And you may have seen this illusion before. I, I can't see any faces, but um, maybe you'll have seen this before. This is Adelson's checkerboard. Uh, and in this illusion, there are two patches, A and B, and hopefully they look to be different shades of gray, with B looking lighter. Now, it's an illusion. Of course, they're exactly the same shade of gray. And I can show you that if I just put another version up with the two patches joined together. And you can see it's one continuous shade of gray. Uh, just to show I'm not messing around, I can move that bar across and you can see now it really is a single continuous shade of gray. But take it away and they look different again. So what's happening here? Well, what's happening here is that the brain is using its prior knowledge encoded into the circuitry of the visual cortex, knowledge that you may not be aware that your brain has that objects under shadow appear darker than they are. And so we see the patch B as lighter than it really is. And this underlines the point that vision isn't supposed to be a camera. It's not supposed to sort of be a light meter. It's supposed to infer what's out there in the world on the basis of ambiguous data. So we see B as lighter than it really is. Now that's one example of the general problem of perception. And, and this is the only equation I'm going to show in this talk, and it's Bayes' theorem. And Bayes' theorem is it provides a framework for understanding what the brain is doing when it's doing this kind of predictive perception. And what it's doing is it's taking what it knows, believes now, the so-called prior, you can see that, that's the curve, the, the, the uh, dotted or short dash line. And Bayes' theorem tells tells us mathematically how to update a prior belief uh, on the basis of new data. And the new data here is the likelihood to come up with an updated belief, which is the, the posterior. This is it's basically going from what we already believe to what we should believe, given some new information when everything is laden with a certain amount of uncertainty. That's what Bayesian inference is all about. And that's, at least at one very high level, that's what the brain has to do when it's trying to interpret the causes of the sensory signals that impinge on its eyes, ears, and so on. Now, fast forward again to the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, we have Hermann von Helmholtz, who was probably the first person to suggest directly that what the brain is doing in perception is a kind of unconscious inference. We're not conscious of this process. We didn't know that our brain knew about how objects behave under shadow. We're only conscious of the outcome of that process. We see the patches being different shades of gray. So Helmholtz talked about perception as a process of unconscious inference. And now we think about this in terms of actual neural circuits and mechanisms. This is one such circuit mechanism story, which is called predictive processing. This is something I've been very interested in for a number of years, nearly 10, well, 15 years now. Um, and this is a way by which the brain can actually achieve or implement Bayesian inference or approximate it. And the idea is that um, what's happening in the brain is that connections that come from the inside out or the top down are continually uh, conveying predictions about the causes of sensory signals. And then the sensory signals, the stuff that flows from the world into the brain, is just conveying the difference between what the brain expects and what it gets at every level of processing. It's conveying the prediction errors. 
And the idea is that by minimizing, by updating predictions to minimize prediction errors everywhere and all the time, the brain predictions will settle on this Bayesian posterior, this best guess of what's out there. And the hypothesis is that that is what we consciously perceive, this continually evolving brain-based best guess that is calibrated by sensory data from the world. Now, this is a really different way to think about perception. We're, we're, it's so um, easy to think for us to think of perception as this process of reading out the world from the outside in or the bottom up, as if the world just pours itself into our minds through the transparent windows of our ears and our eyes and our other senses. This is the sort of naive classical straw man view of perception as a bottom up process of feature extraction from data as it streams into the perceptual cortices. Uh, this is the visual cortex of a monkey and early areas might respond to things like edges and lines and, and then later deeper areas to more complex features like faces and objects. In dramatic contrast to that view, predictive processing suggests that perceptual content is not conveyed by reading out these sensory signals in an inside out in an outside in direction, but it's conveyed by top down predictions. Uh, the bottom up sensory signals convey just the prediction errors, the difference between what we get, what we expect and what we get. So perception is always in process of active generation, not a passive registration of what happens to be out there. Okay. Now, you might think I've diverted a little bit from the core question of consciousness, but what I'm trying to provide is a language in which we can think about why conscious experiences are the way they are. So predictive processing itself is not a theory of consciousness in the sense of like it's telling you the sufficient ingredients for a system to be conscious. It's a general theory of perception and action and cognition and so on that can be used to explain properties of what experiences are like in terms of their underlying mechanisms exactly in the style of the real problems that I just mentioned. Now, let me give you a couple of examples. If something like this is on the right track, it would suggest that we should consciously perceive what the brain expects more accurately and more quickly than what is not expected. And we tested this idea in an experiment many years ago now with my uh, postdoc at the time, Yaya Pinto. And we used a method called continuous flash suppression, where we expose different images to the different eyes. So one eye sees an image of a face or a house, which gradually increases in contrast. And the other eye sees a changing pattern of colored blobs, which gradually decreases in contrast. And what the person sees is firstly just the blobs because they're high contrast. And at some point, the image breaks through into conscious perception and the person just has to press house or face when they see the relevant image. And what we also did, and you can see this here too, is that we cued people to expect a face or a house. And sometimes the cue was valid and sometimes it was not valid. And what we found was when the cue was valid, that's when the sensory data matched the prediction, the expectation, people indeed, indeed responded more accurately and more quickly. So we, people see what they expect rather than what they don't expect at least in this, this one experiment. <clears throat> now, we can use the same idea to think about unusual forms of perception, when perhaps when perceptual predictions overwhelm sensory data. We, we used to this in everyday life when we see things like faces and clouds. Um, this is a, an example of the general phenomenon of pareidolia, seeing patterns in things. We can see faces in clouds, we can see faces in the windows of churches, and so on and so on. Um, the idea being that the brain has a very strong predictions to see faces. Faces are very salient, so we tend to perceive faces even where, when faces don't exist. So what we've been doing in, in my research group at Sussex is taking this idea a little bit further and trying to build computational models of different kinds of visual, um, unusual visual experience method called computational phenomenology or computational neurophenomenology. Now, the first example of this, we used a standard deep learning neural network, which is very good at classifying what objects are in images, but we ran it backwards. This is using an adaptation of an algorithm called Google's Deep Dream. 
And when we did this and, and did this to a panoramic movie that people watched through a VR headset, um, we get something like this. And so there are a lot of dogs in this image. The, the, what's happening is the network is projecting predictions of dog into this panoramic video at every level of granularity. It's not just photoshopping dog pictures onto, a, onto each frame. They're merging from the image in a, in a weird way. And what's critical here is that this isn't a computational model of a function or of a behavior. It's a computational model of what an experience is like. I think that shows the power of this approach to try to understand nature of our conscious experiences. Now, we're taking this a lot further at the moment um, for, uh, with my colleagues, Keske Suzuki and David Schwartzman and Alec Chance, using a bit more complicated neural network models with generative and discriminative components um, to try to simulate different kinds of visual hallucination here. And I'll just give you a taste for this. So what we do in, by, cut, by parameterizing this network in different ways, we take all of these input images and we end up with different kinds of simulated hallucination um, of the sort that people get when they have Parkinson's disease or dementia or Charles Bonnet syndrome when they lose their central vision, as well as different kinds of psychedelic experience. So we're now actually able to model different kinds of visual hallucination. And then we're going back to people who have these different conditions and asking them to pick from our model what is most representative of their own actual lived experience. So we kind of close the loop on this computational phenomenological approach. And the idea is this gives us a handle on understanding the computational basis of altered perception. And by doing that, we understand more about normal perception too. So the take home from this is that hallucination of the sort that we've just seen can be thought of as a kind of uncontrolled perception where the brain's best guesses are not well controlled by sensory signals. But that normal perception in the here and now all the time is also a kind of hallucination, but a controlled hallucination in which the brain's predictions are reined in by sensory signals coming from the world, controlled by these sensory signals in ways that are not determined by their accuracy, but by their utility for the organism. And the larger claim here is that this applies to everything. It applies to not just faces or dogs, but to all the aspects of our experience of the world and of the self. There are all kinds of different kinds of perceptual best guesses. Now, I want to finish by saying that this applies also to the self, to the experience of being a self. Um, and this gets at another intuition I think we need to undercut. And this intuition is that there's a world which we the, the, is perceived by the self. The self is somehow inside the brain and body perceiving the world and then acting upon it. We sense, we think, we act. That's how things seem. But how things are is a bit different, I think. That both experiences of the world and of the self are kinds of perceptual prediction. The self is not the thing that does the perceiving. The self is a perception too. And it's created in the same way. It's created by a process of brain-based best guessing. And there are many ways in which we experience being a self. I'll just focus on one of them, which is the experience of this object in the world that is my body, the experience of embodiment, a core part of what it means to be me. Um, and there's... In fact, there's two parts of this too. One of them is this experience of just having a body, this object in the world that is the body. Um, and the brain is continually inferring what parts of the world are its body and what aren't. And we can see disruptions of this in things like the rubber hand illusion and things like phantom limb syndrome and so on. But there's also a very basic experience of being a body, of being an embodied living organism. Um, associated with moods, with emotions, and at its core, what I propose is just this basic sense of being alive, the feeling of being alive, I think is the core to all our experiences of self and of consciousness in general. Now, this experience of being a body of emotion and mood brings up this interesting field of interoception, not introspection, but interoception. And we normally think of sensation and perception as pertaining to the outside world smell, taste, touch, hearing, vision. But a large territory in the brain, a large amount of neural resource is dedicated to perceiving and controlling 
sensory signals that come from inside the body. This is interoception, sensation perception of the inter physiological interior of the body. These interoceptive sensory signals communicate to the brain things like blood pressure and heart rate and gastric tension and blood oxygenation and all these sorts of things. And this is critical because if you think about it, the primary point of having a brain is not to do science or philosophy or even language. It's to keep the body alive. It's to stay alive. That's what brains are fundamentally for. Now, interoception, even though the brain is dealing with signals that, that come from inside the body, it still has no direct access to what their causes in the body are. So an idea I've been proposing for many years is that interoception still has to work by this same basic principle of prediction and prediction error. The brain makes a best guess about causes of signals from inside the body, and that updates it with prediction errors, and that's what we perceive when we experience things like emotion and mood and embodied selfhood. And there's a critical aspect to this, which I think I, I want to emphasize, which is that interoceptive predictions are about controlling things rather than finding things out. Like in vision, for instance, the, typically the brain wants to figure out what's there. Is it coming towards me or away from me? Is it likely to hurt? Should I eat it? Should I catch it? Should I avoid it? Um, interoceptive predictions about the interior of the body, they don't care where the kidneys are, where the lungs are, what shape anything is. They care about how well regulation of the internal physiology is going, how good a job the brain is doing of keeping the body alive. And predictions can be used for control. In fact, this is another I don't have time to talk about today, but a huge motivation for this view is that this prediction, prediction error cycle is an extremely good way of implementing control, of keeping essential physiological quantities like blood pressure and heart rate and so on, where they need to be in order to stay alive. But it also explains, and this is what I do want to mention in closing, that why different experiences are the way they are. So visual predictions underpin visual perceptual experiences. The brain care cares about what's there. We see objects with spaces in between. Things have a character of spatiality and distances and so on. But interoceptive predictions underpin embodied experience. Interoceptive predictions are all about control and regulation. So we experience emotions, not in terms of things in different places, but in terms of valence, in terms of how well or badly things are going. So this, this exemplifies this real problem approach. We can start to understand the differences between different kinds of experiences in terms of different kinds of predictions. So let me wrap up. What I've tried to explain today is that what we consciously see depends on the brain's best guesses of the causes of sensory signals. This applies to our experiences of things in the world, but it also applies to experiences of being a self, of, for instance, the body as an object in the world, but also of just the experience of being a body, of being a living organism. And these deep-rooted embodied experiences have more to do with control and regulation than with what's, what's there. Now, in the book, I make the case that this is actually the, you know, the fundamental role of a brain is to keep the body alive so we can understand the origin of all perceptual experiences now in terms of their roots in evolution and development and in the day-to-day -day operation in regulating the body in, in life itself. So this brings consciousness much closer to life than to other things like intelligence and so on. And it provides a nice contrast to finish with an old idea of René Descartes. Descartes always gets criticized. I don't want to criticize him too much. He was living in difficult times. But he said, for instance, that talking about other animals, that without minds to direct their movements, animals must be regarded as unthinking, unfeeling machines that move like clockwork. He called them bait machine or beast machines. For Descartes, the status of being alive was irrelevant to the status of being a conscious organism, or at least the kind of consciousness that mattered. And I think entirely the opposite that life and consciousness are intimately connected. We cannot understand consciousness except in light of our nature as living machines, and we perceive the world around us and ourselves within it with, through, and because of our living bodies. I want to finish there and just uh, advertise the book for a second. Why not? Um, I 
I think it is available in India now, um, which is great. And I'd be happy to, to move to the Q&A. Thank you for your attention. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Professor. That was absolutely fantastic. And uh, I'm sure our attendees have had a lovely time listening to you because there are so many questions that have dropped in. So I'm just going to quickly uh, ask you a couple of questions that have come through the q mm. tab as well as our social media. Mm. So the first question that we have here is obviously someone who's done their homework on you because uh, <laughs> the question goes that You've previously written a book called I Benders, The Science of Being and Believing. Uh, but that was a book on optical illusions for kids. Mm -hmm. Why did you write a book uh, on such a deep level of consciousness for adults? And what uh, caused um, and why isn't the book? Why isn't there a book for kids about consciousness? Why are more uh, neuroscientists oh. writing about consciousness for kids? That's a great. That's a, actually a terrific idea. And um, so, I Benders actually was a was a was a oh yeah. Hold on. Yeah, this is like an earlier book, um, and it is for kids. Uh, actually, I I, I co-wrote it with a, a guy called Clive Gifford, who's written a lot of children's books. So I was a sort of main consultant editor for it. So it was it was his thing really. I'd never written a kids book before. It was a really rewarding experience, and it it was it went down very well. Um, and I think there's actually, I think that's a fantastic idea. Maybe that'll be the next thing. Maybe that'll be the next thing I do. And in fact, one of the projects I'm doing this year is, is it's a big art science project, firstly in the UK, but then hopefully in other places in the world. And it's all about perception and how we all see the world differently. You know, we all have different brains. We all perceive different things. There was that famous example of the dress that was white and um, you know, red, gold and white or blue and black. And everybody loves that, but kids really love that. And, and, and in my experience, talking to, I don't have kids, but talking to parents, talking at schools and things, kids are fascinated by these big questions about consciousness, about free will, about, you know, who am I? Where was I before I was born? And they're, they're just, there's a natural curiosity that certainly in the UK, education systems, are totally unresponsive to you know they don't they're not part of any curriculum we get educated out of these big questions and maybe come back to them i mean i came back to it but i was kind of lucky uh so i think you know this part of this big project we're doing in the uk is we're trying to get into every single school every single school in the uk um at the age for kids about the age of seven to eight and then again at 11 to 12 with a set of resources to get them thinking about these questions and hopefully ignite a more lasting interest. So I, yeah, I think, yeah, I should, I should write this another book. <laughs> Great idea. Thank you for the question. Thank you so much. Um, um, the next question that we have here is, um, so there's so much conversation going on about AI and technology and how robots are now going to understand human emotions. So have you personally worked uh, between the areas of tech and consciousness wherein robots can be made more conscious in the coming years? And what's your take on that? Yeah, another great question. In fact, I'm pretty active in that area. In fact, I, I, I work close. So part of my group, my, my PhD was in AI and, and my first job as a postdoc was building robots um, that, that you know, based on neuroanatomy based on the brain mechanisms of perception. So it was a very fascinating area and quite a you know, good chunk of my group at the moment is working at, in machine learning and, and AI at this interface. So my take on this, there's a chapter in the book on this, but, but I think there's a, there's a lot of hubris within the tech and AI communities about conscious robots or conscious machines and Part of this is fueled by science fiction terminators and and so on, um, and part of it I think is fueled by a set of insufficiently examined assumptions about what consciousness is. We 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 humans we think we're smart and that and we know we're conscious, so we think the two go together, and then we also think that okay, so then a computer when it becomes sufficiently smart will also become conscious. Now, for me, there's no justification for that assumption whatsoever. It originates from this residual anthropocentrism where we think we're so special in the universe. 
Um, and the, my work, and I didn't design it to end up this way, but it's led me to the recognition that consciousness is much more deeply entwined with being alive than with being smart. So I don't think you're going to get conscious AI until you start building living machines. Uh, and, but I also don't think we should even be trying to do it. Right? I mean, if you, what is the point? It's not, it's not a cool thing to do, which is what you know, tech communities tend to do things because, hey, it's cool. But if you inadvertently built a conscious machine, and maybe it is possible out of silicon, I don't actually know. I don't think anybody knows for sure whether consciousness can be implemented on a non-biological system. If you did it by accident or by design, then you've introduced uncontrolled amounts of potential suffering into the universe. And that is an ethically unconscionable thing to do. So I'm very vocal against people sort of gung-ho trying to build conscious machines for the hell of it. Very well put. And I must say that's a very, very honest admission. <laughs> Not uh, many researchers are so... Um, uh, absolutely candid about their take on things. That was really nice to hear. <laughs> the next uh, question that we have is actually a very interesting one. Uh, Professor said, I came to know about you and your research in the area of consciousness, uh, which is a very interesting field. And I have registered for the Riken Bio Conference that's happening in Japan. I hope to see you there. Wow. Uh, and <laughs> they have... Uh, Asked you, uh, since they're from a chemistry background, they've asked you about your work with um, uh, chemistry researchers. And if you have any take on how important chemistry is in the science of studying consciousness, what are the correlations and uh, what can chemists do uh, while researching on consciousness? Uh, this is a great, another wonderful question. I think the first thing to say about that is that I think chemistry is, has been hugely underplayed in its role in consciousness research, but in neuroscience and in psychology in, in, in general. And this, this is because we, we still have this hangover of thinking about the brain as a computer. Right? So, all we, so we tend to think what's really important are the neurons and the connections and information flow and all this stuff. And, um, and if you think of the brain as a computer, then you tend to forget that the brain, in a sense, it's an electrical machine. Yeah, that's, it's networks and synapses as action potential is super important, but it's also a chemical machine. It's a wash with neurotransmitters. It's a wash with all kinds of, 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 um, of substances whose interactions are best understood at the level of neurochemistry. You know, it does happen, of course. There's very active branches of neuropharmacology and so on. But I think it's, it's not that well integrated into our understanding of you know, consciousness itself. We tend to think, like in the view I've been talking about people talk about things like dopamine in terms of modulating the balance between predictions and sensory signals and so on. The closest I've come to it personally is in my collaborations uh, about psychedelics. Um, and here it's fascinating, right? Because we have substances like LSD and psilocybin um, and DMT, and we know the neurochemistry very well, that they activate very specifically serotonin 2a receptors and we know where these receptors are and this is all lovely um and we know that they generate massive changes in conscious experience but the middle bit is still very unclear like quite quite why does this, this why what's it's not just changes serotonin and you change conscious experience of course there's lots going on in the middle so so part of my collaborative work is to understand how the pharmacology interacts with measures of like global brain dynamics that explain why psychedelic experiences are the way they are. And that's one example, I think, of a productive collaboration between the chemists and the, um, and the neuroscientists and the philosophers. Thank you. That was a really lovely example. Um, I think the next question that we can take is, um, does consciousness have a genetic or an epigenetic component? Hmm. Almost certainly, right? I mean, I, it's like, I think everything, certainly for Adam, for creatures, there will be a genetic component. Quite how useful that is in explaining. Like, I don't think we're, it's not that genetics is going to address the big question. And, you know, 
in this like solving the genetic code allowed us to understand genetics it doesn't allow us to then understand consciousness um but at a very basic level clearly yes like the way we visually experience the world depends on our visual cortex that is shaped by both genetics and epigenetics you know we we're not born as you know i think certain aspects of our and and i think this this so this relates i think put it this way when you think about perception as this process of predictions and prediction errors you can ask the question where do the predictions come from why does the brain have these prior expectations well you can say they partly come from evolution right so that they they can be if for things that are very stable like light comes from above is a very stable aspect of our environment that could be expected to be a, a prior belief that shapes our conscious experience that is encoded genetically um but other things are developed more epigenetically you know they depend on where we where we've grown up where we, we, what happens um within our environment during ontogeny and so other things happen during our um daily life and then some another take on it would be okay there's a lot of variety in conscious experiences so some people for instance have synesthesia so they will experience colors when they hear sounds for instance or see letters it's a fascinating phenomenon again uh, we've looked into this quite a bit in sussex and there's an active search for okay are there genetic is there a genetic basis for something like synesthesia i think it's very likely that there is and then it'll be interesting to say okay if there is a if there are genetic uh markers of synesthesia do they explain anything about it do, do for instance they lead to increased crosswiring between different parts of cortex so yes i think i think it is a it's a useful approach too it's not something that i've directly worked with though genetics thank you for answering that so uh, well um uh, professor uh, the next question that we have here is you know there's so much of co- uh, talk going on around consciousness and dreams um very very uh, deeply explored topic if i can uh, say that and there are so many neuroscientists who have been actively researching on dreams and the consciousness behind it so there's the question goes what's your opinion on subconscious brain activities like dreams uh, while compared it with real time conscious brain activity um how does it work well i think dreams are, are not subconscious i think dreams are conscious right we we just don't remember them very well and that's that's really a good thing otherwise we'd be very confused uh it'd be hard to know whether a memory was of a real world or of something that happened in a dream if we remember that so actually people often find it frustrating but i'm quite glad that dreams are difficult to remember i think that's necessary um I think dreams are absolutely fascinating phenomenon. We are conscious, but we're conscious in a different way. I mean, we we sort of lack this reflective self-awareness. Weird things happen that we don't experience as being weird at the time. Um tends to be less smell and and, and so on. Um why do we dream is one of these old questions, right? Freud tried to talk about it. There's so many different ideas about dream and a lot of them are often about interpreting the content of dreams somehow. Now, one idea that I think is quite different that I find quite appealing and it's it's just a hypothesis at the moment. Um I think it's a number of people had a similar idea but it's best articulated by an American researcher called Eric Howell at the moment. And it's this idea that um going back to the brain as this predictive mach- prediction machine. Uh you can think of during the day our real time online perception is continuously training this model inside the brain that's generating predictions about the world um now in statistics we know that if we overfit to data we don't generalize to new situations very well this is a well known problem in in any kind of machine learning or statistics you train it out to to particular data you're not going to generalize how do you do that well how do you deal with that well what you can do is there are all sorts of ways to like renormalize your model to 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 so so that you prevent it overfitting dreaming for me and for eric might be what's happening there basically the brain is kind of running its generative models offline um in order to to compensate for the day for the over potential overfitting during the day um 
which would mean to put it in a very simply that we dream so that we can see so that we can perceive better the next day. Let me just ask you a couple of uh, last questions because we're running over time and there are just so sure. much to cover. Maybe we can take two more questions from the audience and that will uh, we'll move towards the conclusion of the session. Okay, so um, you've obviously worked with many researchers making your field of study highly interdisciplinary. So what has your experience been while working with philosophers and while their take on consciousness might be different from yours? How has your experience been in terms of the interdisciplinary aspects of consciousness? Yeah, I, so I, I, this is another really good question. I mean, I think it goes back to the schools thing in a way that, that we all labor within these disciplines and i've always i always found that a bit frustrating that you know the, the world isn't organized according to these different disciplines or really like it is to some extent but not completely and the disciplines that we see in university departments and in and the, you know, the subjects that you choose at school there are many there because it's administratively convenient for them to be there it's not because nature is completely carved at these joints and i always i had a big worry going into science that i thought it would be about increasing specialization. So every stage you throw another subject or discipline away until eventually you know everything about something that nobody else cares about. And this was a big worry, but it was a real relief to me that it didn't turn out that way. That actually, if you're guided by the questions, then the disciplines such as they are organize themselves around the questions. And that for me is like the single piece of advice for sort of young aspiring scientists, philosophers, whatever, keep focus on the questions. Don't, don't think about the curriculum or the whatever. And you, then, you'll, then, then it'll become clear what tools and what things you need to study. So I was always in consciousness, of course. It's, it, it, it's such a, so obvious that you can't encapsulate it within a single discipline. Philosophy is critical. Psychology, neuroscience, computer science, maths, physics, all, all play a role. The humanities too. Um, anthropology too but philosophy is a very interesting example because for a long time consciousness was the territory of philosophy and so there was an interesting period where where there was sort of a bit of a um i would say difficult interaction where philosophers were, were not so receptive to neuroscientists or or psychologists and neuroscientists and psychologists who were studying consciousness was sort of you know steered clear of the philosophy and just made you know, in, in, did interesting experiments, but interpreted them in quite naive ways. One of the joys that I've had at being in this area over the last 20 years or so is seeing a much more productive interaction between science and philosophy. Some of my mentors like Daniel Dennett have really led the charge there. And, and they've been, you know, people who've brought scientists and philosophers together. And I work with philosophers very closely now. I've just written a big review paper on theories of consciousness with a philosopher um, and now I think if you're a philosopher interested in consciousness, you have to know or at least be open to the neuroscience as well. It's, it's just like you won't, it won't work. And the same goes the other way around. If you want, if you're a neuroscientist or physicist or biologist, you have to at least know the territory of philosophy. You're not going to go very far if you don't. But fortunately, this is a really fun thing to do. Um, and it's at these interdisciplinary interactions that there's the most progress to be made and the most to learn. Thank you so much. That was such a lovely answer. Uh, I think uh, there are so many researchers and scientists who have come on the ISF platform and all of them seem to be echoing the same statement that, you know, they're tired of being boxed into these categories. While science is so interdisciplinary in nature, they work with multiple streams, multiple disciplines on a daily basis. Um, I think we've got to start looking at science very differently. And, uh, you know, that was such a lovely answer. I think uh, we'll take uh, one last question and uh, conclude this session. Uh, Professor, we've received two questions on qualia. So what do you think of qualia according to your views of consciousness? Can qualia, qualia be mapped to neural processes? Yeah, this, this really gets it. <clears throat> I think back to the beginning of the talk about these views of the hard problem, the real problem, illusionism, panpsychism. So qualia, the way I understand the term, it's, it is like 
that is the stuff of a conscious experience. Like it's the redness of red, the sharpness of the pain. It's, it's the, and I think there are, this is where I have a little bit of a sympathy for illusionism. Like what do we mean by, by qualia? Do we literally mean some sort of experience stuff that, that is, that is, I don't know, floating in the brain or that is some aspect of information processing or whatever. I'm, I'm not sure that's the most productive way to think. Like, so Dennett, again, one of, one of these, I think, really powerful thinkers in this, this area, um, he had this famous paper called Quine and Qualia, um, talks about this fallacy of double transduction. So like we see, I open my eyes, I see a color in the world, right? Now, I know, we, we all know from Newton, from many people, that colors don't objectively exist in the world anyway, right? They're, they're just electromagnetic radiation, which is colorless. But I still experience a color as being out there in the world. Now, how do we think about that? Well, it's certainly not the case that there is color in the world, that it's then detected by some combination of wavelengths and then somehow reconstructed in the brain. So there's nothing literally green in the brain, right? So, so qualia doesn't exist in, in that sense. Like there is no, the greenness is, is nowhere. The greenness actually isn't anywhere. It's in the interaction between the brain and the world. Um, <clears throat> so I think there's, a, a rel there's, there's one way to think that qualia, for me, it's like the same thing to say generally about consciousness. Yes, qualia exist, but they may not be what we think they are. Thank you so much. And that brings us to the end of this session. Professor said it was an absolute pleasure uh, to hear your talk and to interact with you. And thank you so much for having taken so many questions from our audiences. Next time, we can only hope to host you on ground offline in India at this massive celebration of science. Last words for our audiences. We have a majority of undergraduate students who are just stepping into different disciplines of science, technology, engineering, maths, and are, of course, exploring uh, science communication, science policy. So mm. your final uh, maybe concluding remarks uh, for all of them. And uh, I'd love to know what you think about public engagement platforms such as ISF, given you've been such an active science communicator yourself and have been given, giving so many talks uh, on public engagement platforms so just final words from me sure thank you well, again it's been a real pleasure thanks I'd, I'd love to be there in person too i was i was supposed to be in india in a couple of weeks for one of my nephew's weddings but that's all been postponed because of covid and all this stuff so you know another time but um yeah so public engagement i think i love it i mean i love doing it it's not and it's i think it's difficult. It's not so a lot of I've been lucky to get some funding to do it to sort of buy myself out of some teaching. It's often thought of as something people do in their spare time, which you can, but it, to do it well takes a lot of time. Um, but I think it's hugely important. You know, science is so, it's something to celebrate. It's something to, to share. Uh, not everybody needs to do it. So when I talk about public engagement, universities here, it's, it's like, you know, don't get the impression that everybody needs to be doing all this, but some people need to do it. And if you are going to do it, it's it's worth putting quite some time into it. Um, and so platforms like ISF, I think, are, are, are wonderful. So the more science, there's just such a flowering of science festivals. There's a general engagement with science, which I think is wonderful to see. Um, and sort of an India-specific point. So I, as I said, I've, I have close family links there and come often. Uh, to mainly the UP area. And one thing is that there's been not very much, like I would say India is really strong in certain areas of academia, right? In engineering, computer science, um, and so on, chemistry. But psychology and neuroscience have not been massively uh, prominent in academia in, in, uh, in India. And, and I, would, I think that's changing. You know, I'd like to see it change more, I think these, these are fundamental disciplines for the, for the next century. Um, I know there are some excellent places like my, my friend Narayan Srinivasan in IIT Kanpur has, has got a department. It used to be in Allahabad, which is why I know him, which is where my family is from. Um, so there are a number of good good places. But, but yeah, I mean, I would just like to see the fire of cognitive science, neuroscience uh, really ignite in India. That would be wonderful. 